Welcome to the Modern Athenas podcast with Sonia and Debbie, where we discuss how regular women throughout time became Athenas by working hard, persevering through the challenges in their lives, and contributing to a better world. This is podcast five. In this podcast, we will be discussing the book, In Other Words, by Jhumpa Lahiri. Just a note for our listeners, we are transitioning to Stitcher to make our podcast easier to download for our Android listeners. We will still be up on iTunes, and we are also now up on YouTube and Instagram. Have you ever felt adrift and alone, as though you don't belong to any one community? Have you ever been to a foreign country and not known the language? Have you ever set out to learn a new skill or area of knowledge and been left frustrated by being unable to grasp the skill as quickly as you would have liked? In other words, it's centered around the themes of identity, alienation, and belonging. As we discuss this book and the author's use of language to traverse these difficult topics, we invite you to consider your own life and your own feelings of identity and belonging. Jhumpa Lahiri won the Pulitzer Prize in 2000 for her book, Interpreter of Maladies. Her 2003 book, The Namesake, was also made into a movie. Jhumpa was born in London, the daughter of Bengali Indian immigrants from West Bengal. When she was two, her family moved to the United States. Jhumpa received her BA from Barnard College and master's degrees in English and Comparative Literature and an MFA in Creative Writing, all from Boston University. She received a PhD in Renaissance Studies, also from Boston University. As a young child, Jhumpa spoke Bengali at home. When she started school, she learned her second language, English. In adulthood, she began learning Italian when she spent a week in Florence, Italy. After returning home to New York City from Florence, she continued learning Italian by taking Italian lessons on a continuous basis. However, she never felt like she'd grasped the language in a way that offered her any sort of fluency. 20 years after she first visited Florence, she decided she wanted to totally immerse herself in Italian. By this point, she was married and had children. She uprooted her family from the States and moved to Rome, where she began to read and write solely in Italian. In other words, is a memoir of Jhumpa's love of Italian, her travails of learning the language, and her journey to learn to express herself as an author and writer in Italian. Reading the book, one gets a sense of the difficulties Jhumpa faced in learning a new language as a writer, of the struggles not only to find her written voice, but also to find her own cultural identity after straddling three cultures throughout her lifetime. The book is written as a series of short essays and stories. Each facing page has the original Italian text on the left and the translated English text on the right. Jhumpa did not do the translation herself. The book opens up with a metaphor that guides the reader through Jhumpa's journey. Jhumpa begins the metaphor with the description of a secluded, isolated small lake in Italy. The lake is very deep in the middle. For a month, Jhumpa watched people come to the lake and swim across the lake, yet she continued to swim near the shore, never going too far out. One morning, at the end of the summer, she met two friends at the lake. She decided to make the crossing across the lake with them. After about 150 swimming strokes, she was in the middle of the lake, at its deepest part, and she kept going. After 100 more strokes, she could see the bottom again on the other side. She made it with no trouble. She looked back across the lake and saw the silhouettes of her husband and children. They seemed unreachable, but she knew that they were not. After the crossing, the known shore became the opposite side. In essence, here became there. Jhumpa likens the swim to her learning Italian. For 20 years, she took Italian classes, but always kept her English close by, staying close to the shore. She says, quote, If you study a foreign language in that way, you won't drown. The other language is always there to support you, to save you. But you can't float without the possibility of drowning, of sinking. To know a new language, to immerse yourself, you have to leave the shore, without a life vest, without depending on solid ground. End quote. And so she decides to finally take the plunge and swim across the metaphorical lake, moving her family to Rome and immersing herself in Italian. The lake metaphor is a really good metaphor for challenges that we face in our lives. We often cling to the shore so that we won't have the possibility of drowning, but we also miss the opportunity to float and to swim. I was really struck by this analogy at the beginning and this metaphor for her learning Italian because I took it for a metaphor for a lot of things that I've struggled through and learned in life, especially, you know, where she's in the middle of the lake, it's the deepest part and she looks back and she can't go back and she has to kind of go forward. Yes, I was thinking about how I'm a very routine person, which I think there's a lot of safety in that, you know, eat the same foods every day. I I do the same order of operations in the morning. And um, I'm actually very 
comforted by a routine, but therefore it's a little bit dangerous when, you know, life throws anything at you um, to try to adjust. And um, so that's kind of where my head with, went with where I, I have built in these kind of safeties into my life. Is that something you would relate to? Yeah, I do that a lot. I build in, I mean, maybe I take a risk, but I feel like I have this, a lot of safety nets. It's not just one safety net, it's a lot of them. And the more that I'm in a routine, I find that my safety nets grow. And, you know, I'm, I'm often reminded of, you know, great things don't happen from being comfortable. You have to get uncomfortable. But I think it's, for me, a real challenge to be uncomfortable and to be uncomfortable for a long period of time. Um, part of it's that unknown factor, you know, being uncomfortable and, and striving for something new, what's it going to lead to? And so I go back frequently to that, stay close to the shore, stay close to what I know. I was also thinking a lot about, I'm a new parent still. I still would consider three years old, my son being new, because uh, every day is new. But I'm very much a nurturing, um, wanting everybody to feel at peace kind of personality. And so that's not exactly... Uh, productive with a three-year-old. And so I really have to trust that by going out into the deep water of correcting Ethan and kind of holding the line in a way that's going to really establish these boundaries for him so that he's more secure as a person, I have to trust that that's actually going to happen. And I feel like when Jumpa talks about being in the middle of the lake, you have to kind of trust that you're you're still going to be able to get to the other end and of the lake and um, just keep moving forward in this path that you haven't yet gone, but you kind of assume that there's going to be a, a reward and, and an end result that is going to be worth the journey. When Jupa first moved to Rome and committed herself to immersing herself in Italian, she carried a pocket dictionary with her everywhere. Quote, slowly, after a couple of months in Rome, I realized that I don't check the dictionary so often. When I go out, it tends to stay in my purse, closed. As a result, I start le leaving it at home. I am aware of a turning point, a sense of freedom, and, at the same time, of loss, of having grown up, at least a little. By now this small dictionary seems more like a brother than a parent, and yet it is useful to me, it still guides me, it remains full of secrets. This little book will always be bigger than I am." End quote. Reading about the dictionary made me think a lot about what we were just talking about with the security nets or those security blankets in life, things that you cart with you, um, either throughout your childhood or throughout adulthood, literally material items that bring you some comfort. Yeah, I really had to think about this because I think probably uh, you don't really, you kind of take for granted those items and at first I thought, you know, music, it's not a material item, but it's been with me my entire life. And I think that it, I really rely on that being in, around me, even if it's kind of uh, an ambient room noise. Um, I work at an orchestra, but I also was almost wondering if social media could be a security blanket. Uh, what do you think about that? Because I, I think that in a way, a security blanket is something you go to for comfort or affirmation or happiness or laughter or, you know, things you go keep going back to. And I'm ashamed to say that I think so social media has become a little bit of a security blanket for me. But uh, it really that kind of really struck me as maybe something that I do carry with me every day. Yeah, I hadn't really considered social media. It definitely, for me, brings me comfort to connect with people who I would have otherwise lost touch with um, throughout life. But it is nice to go back and to have those conversations with people and pick up, um, you know, posts by each other and comment on them. And it's like you're traveling back in time to this either, you know, for me, a lot of it's going back to my college days where I hung out with the same people, you know, 40, 50 hours a week. And so talking to them definitely takes you back. It's a little nostalgic, but it also is very comfortable. Like your music, I was thinking about books. So I have this tendency when I find a book I like, I reread it a ridiculous number of times. And I, it made me think of Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card, because I've literally read that book probably 15 times. And I have this one bookshelf in particular that has all of these books that the spines are so broken, the pages are starting to fall out. 
um, because I've continued to read them over and over and over again. And it's not as though I don't have a hundred books at home that I could read. I do, but these books just bring me comfort and they, they take me away to the, to the places in the book. And it, for a short period of time when I'm reading them, it transports me into that world and it kind of de-stresses me and, and takes that away. And, you know, Jumpa in the dictionary, I can only imagine you know, going to Italy and and before there were smartphones and apps and everything where it's easier now to communicate with people in a different language. She, when she first went to Florence, she takes this little pocket dictionary and tries to break down that language barrier by using the dictionary. And you could hear in the book that originally, you know, it was a struggle for her to get multiple words out. And I, I kind of feel like she was able to rely on the dictionary as that sort of known in an unknown world. And it showed her progress as as she was able to leave it in her bag, but she still felt that comfort at being at her side and, and ready to help her if she needed it. But I think she also felt uh, a little bit proud that she could just carry it now and not have to refer to it. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think about that with some of the things that I've carried with me. I have this box of treasures that I have have just carried with me throughout life. And, you know, one of them is this, it's literally a whittled stick that I made at Girl Scout camp. Um, And it has this little piece of leather tied around it and these beads on the leather. And it meant something tremendous to me when I was a counselor in training. It was part of our like little training process. And I have a similar thing when I went on Outward Bound, we use parachute cord. And for each phase of Outward Bound that we went through, we got a new bead on the cord. And I keep these things in a box because it reminds me sort of of these good times in my life. Yes, I have a box of various items that have come with me everywhere and made several moves. And sometimes the box gets repacked, but every time I have to like repack it because the box is deteriorating, even though it's been sitting in an attic, you know, it's, it's kind of heartwarming to go through these old memories and remember you know, various times of your life and what did, you know, what's actually in there. My parents actually just sent me a box of some kindergarten workbooks that they had because they moved from one house to another. And uh, those, those were pretty special to hold on to. Yeah. And, you know, I can only imagine what Jumpa's dictionary was like by the time that she was done with her week in Florence. You know, I'm sure that she had dog-eared some of the pages and, you know, highlighted and, and underlined the words. And I definitely have, I've kept, and I don't know if I want to be admitting this to the public on a podcast, but I've been, I've kept some of my papers I wrote in college and other things like that, because again, it's that like source of nostalgia, of, of comfort, of the, of the road you've traveled through life. Early in her time in Rome, before she could have a dialogue in Italian, before her ear could listen and her brain could think in Italian, Jumpa compared learning a new language to having a new relationship. Quote, it seems like a language with which I have had have to have a relationship. It's like a person met one day by chance, with whom I immediately feel a connection, of whom I feel fond. As if I had known it for years, even though there is still everything to discover. I would be unsatisfied, incomplete, if I didn't learn it. I realize that there is a piece inside me to welcome it. I feel a connection and at the same time a detachment, a closeness and at the same time a distance. What I feel is something physical, inexplicable. It stirs an indiscreet, absurd longing, an exquisite tension, love at first sight, end quote. And I was really struck by how she described having this relationship with Italian, especially at the beginning, where it was both comfortable and unnerving at the same time. And I, I, I think that whenever we're learning a new skill or knowledge of something and, you know, a new area of study, I think you feel that you feel this like intimate closeness with it, even at the beginning, but at the same time, it's kind of scary how much you need to learn. And I felt like she hit the nail on the head in describing how I feel as a parent and probably many others do um, love at first sight. I mean, everybody loves to share pictures of, you know, the first day of a newborn. And and it's true. I mean, there's this instant bond that I have with Ethan. And and at the same time, you know, there's a real struggle because it's completely new and you're kind of navigating these new worlds. And um, I thought the detachment comment was really interesting because there would be times, not so much anymore, but, you know, in those first two, three years where I would just look at Ethan, I'm like, where did you come from? Like, she's this brand new person that 
you know, I didn't even know, but um, I, it's almost like I can't believe I get to share my life with him. But it's it's kind of this love at first sight with these inherent challenges. Yeah, and I've moved career fields multiple times during my adulthood. And I thought the same thing about her, her sentence of, I feel a connection at the same time of detachment, because you arrive in this new career field, sort of eyes wide open, and you're excited, and you want to dive right in, and you want to learn everything. And at the same time, you have this detachment because you don't know everything. So you're kind of standing back a little bit, not afraid, but a little bit sort of in wonderment of everything that's in front of you. And you kind of just want to take it all in and just watch as well. Eventually, Jumpa met with her first Italian publishers. One of them was also her translator. At this point, she was still doing all of her interviews and presentations in English with an interpreter next to her. She could more or less follow the Italian, but couldn't adequately express herself yet in Italian. Quote, The language still seems like a locked gate. I'm on the threshold. I can see inside, but the gate won't open. They gave me the key. They stopped speaking to me in English. Because in the end, to learn a language, to feel connected to it, you have to have a dialogue, however childlike, however imperfect, end quote. And I think this goes back earlier to my comment about being comfortable, being uncomfortable. At some, t at some point, I feel like with new experiences, you have to sort of leap off that cliff and just take the plunge and wait for yourself to fall and to hit the water below. And I definitely likened this to... Um when I started my current job about two years ago, I was moving into a leadership position at a new company and I now oversee 10 people, whereas before I only oversaw one. So I was very uncomfortable to say the least, um, mostly with, because I didn't feel like I'm an authority figure and I thought that that's what you're supposed to be if you're leading a department. But of course I realized pretty quickly on, I just needed to be a leader and kind of support this team and ask a lot of questions. And I became pretty comfortable with not knowing what I was doing, <laughs> and uh, but also embracing kind of this new knowledge and just um, kind of making the pos position into something I really felt I could uh, believe in, which was supporting my team. Yeah, and it's interesting because in reading this and thinking about jumping off a cliff, it took me back to when I was a first-year attorney just coming out of law school. So... For our listeners, law school in the United States is three years long, and after law school, you spend the entire summer studying for the bar exam. And I took the bar exam in California, which is, other than New York, probably the most notorious for its low pass rate. And it's this three-day exam that you sit for. It's essays, it's multiple choice, it's this sort of performance exam or these fake scenarios that they give you and that you have to write about. And so here you are studying for three months. Sometimes it's knowledge that you learned in law school. Often it's new knowledge, but you have to, it's a huge amount of information that you have to take in and then push out on the bar exam. When you're done with the bar exam, most of the now almost attorneys unlicensed start working. Um, immediately. And they can't work as attorneys because the bar, until they literally pass the bar and the results come out, which in California isn't until the Friday before Thanksgiving, they can work almost like a law clerk. Um, so you work under the guise of other licensed attorneys. And I remember my very first day at work at my first firm, and I'd worked there in between my second and third year of law school. And I was given this research assignment and told that I needed to write a paragraph for a brief that was um, going up to the appellate court. And I had no idea about the topic that I was sent to research. I mean, I had a little bit. And you learn legal research skills in law school. But here I was in the real world. And I, I had this and they were relying on me to make sure that I had all the right case law and that I had, you know, looked through all the treatises and that I had all the information that they needed and to synthesize it into this one paragraph. And I remember feeling so scared of disappointing them and, and failing on this. But I sat at my computer for probably 10 minutes and was almost panicking, having this huge anxiety about starting. And finally, I booted up the search engine, which was LexisNexis at that time, and, and Westlaw, they're two different ones, and just started doing this hunt for cases. And as I started working through it, I became more and more comfortable because research was something that I had done a lot of in law school. And so as I realized like that these were skills that I had learned, it enabled me to 
you know, become a little bit more comfortable. And then with each passing assignment, it, you become a little bit more comfortable. And by the time that you get licensed and then you're a second, third, fourth year attorney, you're starting to do more complex assignments. Um, and then you have to step off the cliff again. You have to go to court for the first time by yourself. You have to argue a motion for the first time by yourself. Um, and those are all sort of scary events for someone who's never done them. And you're expected to be at this high professional level. Um, and yet it's, it literally feels like you have to just step off that, that cliff. And, you know, I'm reminded by um, someone who, who says frequently, you know, just step, just go, just try. Um, and I think that that really holds true. And Debbie, do you feel like you grew and became just a stronger person because of those experiences? I do. And it's interesting because before those experiences, I always took risks. But like Jumpa, I stayed close to the shore most of the time. And I realized um, pretty early on when I got to my second law firm that I was going to be given a lot more responsibility. And so I had a great mentor who was very much supportive of whatever I tried to do, you know, so I went for my first hearing and we kind of role played it beforehand. And, you know, he was super supportive when I came back and I was really nervous, but I realized with having that support and having that mentor, um, I was able to take more risks than I think I would have. And over time I became more and more comfortable with things. And I also became more comfortable with taking bigger risks. And now I'm pretty comfortable stepping into the unknown, at least in career, um, because I realize it's not as scary as I once thought it was. And I think if we can remain humble as we step out into the unknown and be teachable, that seems to be very beneficial because I think the people who might step out and not leave room to fail or learn something new or give grace to themselves in those instances probably are not going to reap the same rewards. I know I've definitely experienced both. Uh, attitudes, but I try to be teachable, especially in those unknown areas. Yeah. And I think that like for you going from supervising one person, which in reality isn't that hard. Um, you know, it's one person you have to direct that energy to, but then you transition that to a team of 10 people. I mean, that has, that's vastly different leadership skills. And I would think that you have to learn how to allow them to have their space to to be good leaders and to be team players. And that, uh, for me, that's always difficult. What about for you? It was, I, I mean, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I just decided I was going to spend like six months just learning how they do things. And then like there was one particular thing I wanted uh, to, you know, to kind of implement, but I think I waited about a year until I was really sure I was implementing the right version of what I wanted to do. And I think that was really a, a good step because I learned to trust them and their work. And I think in, hopefully in a turn, they, they learned to trust me and that I wasn't going to just implement something that was uh, arbitrary and un irrelevant to what we were going to try to accomplish. Yeah. And I think that's sort of your team having trust in you and you and them. And then it also goes sort of up the ladder and your boss having trust in you and you in your boss. I think that that makes a significant difference when you're taking risks rather than if you're feeling very unsupported and you're stepping out into the unknown and you don't have those safety nets of, of people to kind of catch you and to help you along. Jumpa speaks often about imperfection and about how she will never be a true native speaker of the language, how she will never truly know every Italian word possible. Quote, it's impossible for the gardener to control nature perfectly. In the same way, it's impossible for me, no matter how intense my desire, to know every Italian word. But between the gardener and me, there is a fundamental difference. The gardener doesn't want the weeds. They are to be pulled up, thrown away. I, on the other hand, gather up the words. I want to hold them in my hand. I want to possess them. When I discover a different way to express something, I feel a kind of ecstasy. Unknown words present a dizzying yet fertile abyss, an abyss containing everything that escapes me, everything possible, end quote. She also mentions, quote, I don't think my project is a waste of time. I know that its beauty lies in the act of gathering, not in the result, end quote. I was sort of struck by Jumpa's discussion of learning it, every Italian word, I akin it to learning the details of something and about how sometimes when we're learning a new skill or, or knowledge, we just want to dive right in and we don't want to go through those incremental steps of learning 
um, that, which end up providing the foundation for us to be able to learn the bigger concepts. Yeah, I I think in, a, in probably almost everything that I do, I kind of seek perfection, which is good it, as raising a standard, um, you know, everything you do to a certain standard. But at the same time, I know that I have a fear of failure. And that makes me cautious in my goal setting. And uh, so we've talked about goal setting already, but um, I've also found that if I set actually what I think is almost an unattainable goal, but it's really something I would love to do, that I am more uh, more focused on learning all the details because I, I, there's kind of that unknown factor and and ignorance, uh, basis of ignorance. But I've found that those goals that I've set that are almost unattainable at first, I actually grow further and I, I grow I grow much stronger in the journey. For instance, I currently have a fitness goal, which is still rather unattainable, but it's the Murph Workout Memorial Day 2017. And um, But at the same time, I know it's really unattainable right now, but I, it makes me work more intensely and more focused on the details and willing to kind of maneuver and adjust because I have that long-term goal in mind. Yeah, and just for our listeners who don't know, Murph is a CrossFit workout that was named after Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who was killed in action. And Sony, do you want to tell people what the workout is? Yeah, it's uh, run a mile, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, and run a mile. And yes, it's going to be as hard as it sounds. <laughs> I'm about uh, maybe halfway there. But it's, you know, and that's a good metaphor for a lot of things. But I think I've found when I've really set this goal that's going to stretch me and it's there's a f amount of fear in that because you might not attain it i've actually learned the most in those situations yeah i i set this goal last year there's a there's a trail up up here in uh sort of the northwest corner of washington um it's called the heliotrope trail and it's supposed to be one of the most beautiful trails in the north cascades but it it kind of is difficult to get to and then it's a very challenging trail because there's river crossings and um, and portions you basically have to slither across a log to be able to sort of move forward on the trail but your reward is this gorgeous scenery and at the end of the trail you get to you're literally overlooking a glacier and it's just gorgeous and so all summer long and all spring long last year I had set this goal that I wanted to do the heliotrope trail by the end of the summer and I ended up in early July once the snowpack was low enough I ended up going out early one morning and it's very light here during the summer so I think I left the house about like 4 35 a.m. I got onto the trail just after 6 in the morning and I had it all to myself the whole hike in, I was had the trail completely to myself. And I got to the first river crossing and I thought, oh, this isn't bad. No big deal. It's like a creek. Like, hmm, snowpack must have already melted. Well, later I find out that was in fact not a river crossing. That was a creek crossing. Um, because later on I found the river crossing and it was, I sort of sat myself on this log and literally laid down on the log and slithered across this log. And it's not something that I ever would have done by myself before. Um, but I wanted to set this goal of doing this solo hike. And by the end, I got to the glacier and it was just gorgeous. And then it started raining. So I had taken my camera out and kind of pushed it underneath my jacket. And I took these beautiful pictures of the glacier. And then I turned around and I saw this just alpine meadow and it was full of wildflowers and these rocks with cascading water coming down and it was it's literally everything you've seen in like the Lord of the Rings and in the movies I mean it was just gorgeous and I realized then that setting these goals for yourself and conquering these incremental steps to reach your goal really add up by the time that you get to your goal and you certainly feel pretty proud of yourself and you know it's this absolute sense of accomplishment and I mean in order to do that trail I had to get really good at hiking up mountains which believe it or not is not a problem here um, there's there's plenty of hills but I wasn't very good at hiking the hills so I got I you know worked through the spring and summer to get better at hiking hills I did more trail running so I was in better shape um, but then at the end of the day it was really overcoming my fear of, of hiking alone and overcoming my fear of these these river crossings which are pretty notorious and you know it was definitely a sense of accomplishment so Debbie do you find that you have memories of that journey like those the, the points along the way are they equally strong as like 
the the full reward of doing the whole trail? Well, you know, it's interesting because I find that oftentimes as you do these incremental steps, you don't remember them all, nor do you really remember the whole journey that it took you. You you kind of remember the end. But in this case, I did because I kind of looked at each incremental step as an achievement. You know, the first day that I was able to trail run up this, well, they call it a hill, but uh, for anybody that lives in the Midwest, it was a mountain. Um, you know, I, I definitely didn't think it was a hill, um, but I took this trail up to this lake and, and ran all the way up the trail. It was about a two mile climb. Um, and that was pretty rewarding. And you get to this gorgeous lake at the end. Um, but that was one memory that I definitely held on to because that was sort of my prep to walk the heliotrope trail. Um, and then there were, there were a few other moments, but I certainly don't remember the grind of getting out and working for the goal all the time. I think that when you reach these goals, you forget how hard it was to get there. What about you? Yeah, well, and I'm in the midst of this kind of fitness goal, and there's definitely been bumps along the way. But, you know, I was just thinking back to about, I think it was New Year's Day, I was all revved up, and I did a certain portion of the Murph. And, you know, I just get this feeling of accomplishment and strength and, um, kind of the motivation to persevere through other things because I have been able to kind of achieve things that I've never done before, you know, 50 pull-ups. I mean, it's, it, it, give, it actually fuels other areas of my life and also keeps me pretty, it, I, I like to say it checks my ego each day when I try to do these things that I haven't done before. And sometimes I accomplish it and sometimes I don't, but I think it, it provides a, a level of equilibrium too in other areas of my life. Yeah, and I think it's hard too when you're working towards goals to just keep the goal in sight. You know, sometimes you get, huh, I'm remembering this this moment in CrossFit where I couldn't do a double under. And a double under is when you jump and the rope passes underneath your feet twice before your feet land again. And the double under is a very common movement in CrossFit. And it's also extremely common for beginners to have a hard time doing it because you basically have to prance on your feet and leave on your toes and go high enough that the rope can go underneath. So you've got to make sure that your foot movement is good, almost like a um, just a very fluid, straight up prance, just from your toes rather than, for instance, what I was doing at the beginning, which was sort of this mule or donkey kick where I was kicking my feet behind me to jump higher, which is what I did when I was a kid jump roping. So it was a bad habit that I had to unlearn. And then you also have to learn how to spin the rope quickly enough so that you can get it around twice. So you got to work on your wrists and sort of that that motion as well. And then you got to link it all together. And I remember just getting so frustrated with it. And I asked everybody for help. And I was just, I was losing sight of the goal, which was to do one double under because I was getting really frustrated with my kick. I was really frustrated with my wrist. And morning after morning after morning, I kept trying to get one double under. And it took me, I believe, about six months of pretty constant work. And my coach was ridiculously patient um, and, and trying to help me get to that goal. But it was just that day that I got one was miraculous. And then I had a buddy it was working out with me and says, she says to me, well, if you got one, can you get two? And I thought, no, because it took me six months to get one. Um, but I was like, well, I'll try it. And I got five in a row. And I was like, wow, that was incredible. Um, and all of a sudden in that moment, all the work to get there was, was was worth it. But I think that it's, you know, keeping your eyes focused on the goal and like your Murph challenge, you know, I know you've had some struggles along the way. And I think it's hard sometimes to remind yourself how far you've come um, rather than how far you still have to go. Yeah, and the other thing I was thinking of when in her quote, uh, I don't how she doesn't think about the project as a waste of time. There's a real sh- uh, she shows a, a real appreciation for the everyday, and I, that's definitely something I've been trying to focus on in the last year or so. Is just you know having the long term goal, but not forgetting about today and living through today and enjoying every moment. And that's definitely something I find rewards in then with each day and seeing the little successes and the little wins are almost as important as, you know, accomplishing this mountain of a goal. But I think it's those little wins that fuel each day as well. Six months before leaving for Rome, Jumpa stopped reading in English. Once she moved to Rome, Jumpa filled notebooks with Italian words, phrases, and sentences. She also kept a private diary, which was a secret project. Quote, The new diary, although riddled with mistakes, mirrors my disorientation clearly. It reflects a radical transition, a state of complete bewilderment. The diary provides me with the discipline, the habit of writing in Italian. 
end quote. And I was really struck by the way that Jumpa was very, very disciplined in her learning. So she she describes much more thoroughly in her in her book about these notebooks where she's writing everything she doesn't know. So every time she hears an Italian word or phrase she doesn't know, it goes in the notebook. And she continues to review these notebooks and sort of learn the language both verbally and by reading through these notebooks and really understanding the words and the phrases and how they're, you know, teased out and verb tenses and all of the things you have to learn with a new language. And it struck me as it was a great metaphor for discipline in our daily lives, that you have to be committed and dedicated to what you're doing. Well, um, the newest skill that I've learned is actually, I would say, podcast production, which is kind of uh, you know, I didn't even plan on that three months ago trying to learn how to do it. But you have to immerse yourself, I did, into all different ways to learn, you know, whether it's watching videos, or it's actually listening to other podcasts, and then diving into this whole other tech side. But, you know, you kind of have to immerse yourself completely and then come out with whatever makes sense. Because, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in anything technical. But, um, you know, it, it's about stepping out and kind of keeping your eyes open but be willing to adapt and keep moving forward. But I think I, I get the sense that probably she get really, she, as Jumpa got really immersed in this disciplined method, probably a, a couple down, months down the road, she kind of realized how far she had come. And when you're in the thick of it, sometimes it doesn't feel like you've gone too far, but she definitely progressed very quickly, whether she realized it or not. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's not just like you mentioned, it's not just learning a new language. So like when we started podcasting, uh, just for our listeners, Sonia and I, neither one of us had any experience in podcasting. So we had to sort of figure out how to get it started and figure out what we wanted to do and figure out how we wanted to drive content. And for me, um, I was going into it pretty naive on on the amount of work that it would take to do it. For instance, you know, all of you were enjoying us talking about these books, right? Well, we have to pick the book, and then we got to read the book, and then we got to prep for the podcast. And, you know, I certainly had no idea about the the time involved, but it's a constant discipline because I'm constantly having to read for the podcast and sort of maintain that focus on this podcast, the next podcast, three podcasts out to be able to ensure that we're providing good quality for our listeners. And so it's definitely become a daily discipline for me to do work on the podcast um, and, and to focus on it. And I know that there's a lot of people out there who do have other daily disciplines. So for some people, it's meditation. Some people, it's prayer. Um, you know, some people, it's exercise. Some people, it's, you know, for instance, yoga, or maybe they go for a run every day or whatever these little daily disciplines that you have are, they really start to add up. And there was a gentleman by the name of Admiral McRaven who gave a speech at uh, University of Texas. It was a commencement speech. And he listed these 10 things. And he was a Navy SEAL. And so he listed these 10 sort of daily disciplines or things that you should learn how to do or ways that you should kind of operate. And his very first one was something called, um, in, to paraphrase it, it was make your bed every day. Because if you get nothing else accomplished with your day, you've made your bed. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about that when I was reading about Jumpa and filling these notebooks. And it's like, if she learned nothing else in a day, she was able to put more information into her notebooks or she was able to write in her private diary. And it's these incremental steps that really start to add up. Well, and the thing about a diary is, it's you know, she calls it a secret project. That it's, it's these types of things that we kind of only do that we see. And it's important that we do things that we aren't expecting others to see, or we don't do it for that reason for others to see. And I find that it's those, that's where we can really grow and discipline is discipline to ourselves. And I've definitely in the last year, my fitness goals have really uh, skyrocketed because I've been able to kind of just actually take the time out for myself. That was the whole reason I got back into working out because I wanted to feel better about my body and, and my strength levels and everything. And I think that it's what, what we do kind of in our own, for ourselves in our own little secret lives can really empower us. Yeah. And it's interesting because with the advent of social media, people are, t people tend to post, I laugh, but people tend to post 
constant pictures or constant posts about what they're up to and what they're doing. And in a way, it kind of destroys that that privacy that you have around your daily disciplines and that privacy that you have working towards a goal. And I know for some people, they find it very motivational to share their progress with others. But I think it, in a way, it can also be detrimental because it's not feeding your sort of self-discipline at that point. You're getting your motivation externally and that motivation can end up being fleeting. And what if you don't get enough likes on your post or what if no one responds to your post and you start to tie your success and your, your sort of future ambition about the goal into the social media response to, to what you're posting. Um, whereas, you know, if you, for instance, if you meditate 10, 10 minutes every morning and you know, you're not posting it on social media, but it's your self daily discipline 10 minutes a day, every day starts to add up. And pretty soon you've got a habit that really benefits your overall health and also your overall sense of accomplishment. And so then maybe you branch out to another new habit and you start something else that's new. And, you know, people start 10 to 20 habits all at once, right? New Year's Day is a great example. People make, you know, New Year's resolutions and they're like, well, I'm going to get fit. I'm going to not eat all this sugar food. I'm going to, you know, do 20 minutes of meditation every day. I'm going to ride my bike to work every day. I mean, it's a, it's a laundry list rather than focusing on one small thing that they can do for themselves without announcing it on social media or to the world to improve themselves. Well, and I would encourage our listeners, you know, if you're thinking about, oh, maybe I should do this or that for myself the answer is probably yes, you should, because you got, you know, it's, we owe it to ourselves to take care of ourselves because we'll be better equipped to take care of others and contribute to our jobs. And, and, uh, you know, it, it took me three years after having a son um, to finally realize, honestly, it was important enough for me to take care of myself and, you know, through fitness and everything. And it's definitely been worth it. I'm so much healthier now than I was a year ago and mentally and spiritually and physically. And so if you're contemplating, you know, doing something for yourself as a new daily discipline, definitely take it on that it'll so be worth it. Yeah. And I would second that. And it's, you know, I know a lot of our listeners are probably thinking, I don't have time to do any kind of daily discipline. I am literally running from the time that I wake up or the time that the kids wake me up until the time that I'm crashing into bed at night. And I would really, really challenge you to look at your day because I bet you could find 10 minutes, whether that's waking up 10 minutes early or going to bed 10 minutes later or at your lunch hour spending 10 minutes. But 10 minutes is not a lot of time and you can accomplish a great goal or a habit just with using that that 10 minutes in a day. Quote, every time she remembered something of her past life, she was convinced that another version would have been better. She considered herself imperfect, like the first draft of a book. She wanted to produce another version of herself. End quote. I was really struck by that because here she is, this Pulitzer Prize winning author, very famous, and yet she struggles with the same insecurities that the rest of us do. You know, you look back at your past and you think, oh, I wish I would have done that differently. Um, you know, it's like Robert Frost's poem, The Road Less Traveled, you know, two roads diverge in a wood and I took the one less traveled. Um, and that's made all the difference. But it's it's this, you know, your life continually sees these branches in the road and, and whichever one you choose is the one that you choose and you can't go back and rewind it and make a different version of yourself. Wow. Yeah. I think as I've uh, grown older, I, my my rear view mirror is shorter and shorter, if that makes sense. Like my 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 visibility in my rear view mirror. I mean, I I think by necessity you can't dwell on the past. You can learn from it, and you shouldn't forget it. But dwelling on it, I I've found t it just sends me into you know anxiety and and you know kind of uh, stops me me from being productive. But on a very tangible level, I was thinking about how I reread work emails even after I've sent them. <laughs> Maybe no one else does this, but it's so stupid. But sometimes if there's been kind of a a kind of critical message I had to get across and I hit send and I'm fully committed to what I have to say, but then I'll go back and like reread it just to make sure I said everything the way I thought I meant to. And um, I don't know, is that something that you do? Or am I just a weirdo? <laughs> no, you're definitely not the only one that does that. And it's sometimes before I send an email, I will reread it three or four times. And then I have this folder in my inbox at work that's called send later. And I put all these emails into my send later folder, and I don't send them right away. So I don't 
type an address into the to line. So just in case you use Outlook at work, FYI, sometimes you hit the send button instead of moving it to where it needs to go. So it's like, <laughs> nuts, I didn't mean to send it. Um, but I literally will draft these emails. If it's dealing with a difficult topic or I'm concerned about how the receiver is going to read the email or it's about a topic where it's very important that I'm getting a, some critical facts across, I will absolutely put it into send later. I'll walk away from it and come back in like an hour, maybe two, sometimes overnight, reread it, edit it, and then send it. Because I find that it gains me some perspective on the, you know, on, on what the words are saying. Um, and I can only imagine, you know, how much writing and rewriting Joompa had to do, especially in the early days of learning Italian and writing in Italian, and how many times she must have, you know, drafted and redrafted and, you know, drafted again um, before she was ever satisfied with her writing. Well, and she definitely comes across as a very honest, but teachable. Um, obviously, she's teachable, she's learning a new language, but kind of humility, I think, is really key to not dwelling on are regretting in the past in, in the sense of, let's just say these work emails, you know, you hit send. And then I, I try to be, remind myself to be humble because if I've actually said the wrong thing or took the wrong action, it's going to be okay. And I shouldn't dwell on the fact that I did, I chose one path over another. Um, but I, I've found the rewards in being humble because then it, it kind of leaves the options open to, okay, we can correct this path, we can adjust. And uh, I think that that's really been an eye opening kind of realization in my own, in my own life. Speaking of writing, let's go back to the book. Quote, why do I write? To investigate the mystery of existence, to tolerate myself, to get closer to everything that is outside of me. If I want to understand what moves me, what confuses me, what pains me, everything that makes me react, in short, I have to put it into words. Writing is my only way of absorbing and organizing life. Otherwise, it would terrify me. It would upset me too much. End quote. And I was really struck with you know, her, her desire to really understand herself through her writing. Yeah, you know, I, I spent a lot of my life and I still do play music, but uh, a lot of my life was spent studying the oboe. And I went, that's all my schooling is in that. And so playing an instrument and playing music was a part of every day for several hours. And, you know, sometimes I'd ask myself, why am I doing this? Because it would get very stressful. But, you know, in a sense, it was kind of exploring this other side of me, this creative side. And, you know, you had to interact with others when you're playing in ensembles and everything. But um, it was kind of, it seems like writing was very complex for Jumpa. It was this something she loved at times and, and kind of hated at times, but it was a part of her and it, it kind of evolved as she, she grew. And, and, you know, I think definitely music in my life has been something similar. Yeah, and you know, when she talks about it's her way of absorbing and organizing life, in a sense, it's her way to filter life. Um, and I think that everybody has that filter. Depend, You know, a lot of people use different things for it, but, you know, your music, her writing, um, for me, it's reading. Uh, I think everybody has that way that they kind of look through that filter to be able to see their life, to organize it, to make it less chaotic, and in a way, to lower anxiety and to make it less stressful. It's extremely useful to know that there are certain heights one will never be able to reach. They make us aim at perfection and remind us of our mediocrity. Although I know I'll never write like Cervantes, like Dante, like Shakespeare, nevertheless I write. I have to manage the anxiety that those heights can stir up. Otherwise, I wouldn't dare write. I think that an awareness of impossibility is central to the creative impulse. Without a sense of marvel at things, without wonder, one cannot create anything. If everything were possible, what would be the meaning, the point of life? So this is a this is a, a quote where she's really talking about this this notion that though she's she's a Pulitzer Prize winning author, she's never going to reach sort of the the height or the level of a Dante or a Shakespeare. And you know, I was thinking, I think there's a lot of things in our life where that's true. Where even if we reach our goal, we're never going to be the fastest, the best, the most achievement or award winning person. Um, you know, I know that that's true in my career. I know that that's true know in a lot of my exercise and I have this goal on my bucket list that I'll totally out myself right now but one of my goals is to eventually uh, do a run that's longer than a marathon I want to get into ultra running right but it's not that I'm going to be an award-winning ultra runner 
um, you know, but it's, it's sort of trying and at least attempting to get to the goal. For me, it's a lot about relationships and the different roles that I play, you know, a, a wife and a mother and a daughter and a, and a supervisor. And I fail every day in, in any of those areas, but I think, you know, it's still, there's a lot of, and also there's a lot of kind of mainstream models of what a perfect wife or a perfect mother, a perfect daughter or friend looks like out there. And so it can get very overwhelming in that when you see all these kind of artificial models of perfection as to where, you know, you could feel pretty defeated in, in certain areas. But I think that, um, you know, taking each day and giving grace to yourself and and to each other in, in the in the ways that we might be failing, you know, we also then on the flip side will be able to recognize those small achievements each and every day. And it kind of slows time down and, and really makes us savor each moment as opposed to, you know, keep striving for this imperfection and being, you know, not, I think we'll miss a lot of things if we're not recognizing each day the accomplishments that we achieve. Yeah. And, you know, again, I go back to social media because people post photos on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever medium you're using for your social media. And they post these photos and often they look like absolute perfection. You know, maybe they're sitting at a beach drinking a, you know, frozen drink with a little umbrella in it. Or, you know, maybe they have just finished a race or whatever it is, but it's these snapshots of perfection. And what you never actually see is all the work that it took to get to the perfection or the fact that, for instance, you know, you take a picture of your kids smiling at the camera. Well, maybe they had a complete temper tantrum just 20 minutes later and you were beside yourself and didn't know what you were going to do with them the rest of the day. And so I think it's allowing and accepting everybody to have imperfections and to not expect that your life is perfect and to realize that these photos that everybody's posting is just a glimpse into their life and their life is also imperfect. And there is no right way to be a parent. There is no right way to be a spouse. There is no right way to be a life partner or, you know, to be a coworker or a friend. There's no one true path to any of those things. And I think that the more that we can all accept that and praise each other and congratulate each other on what we accomplish rather than focusing on the imperfection, I think it could make a really big difference. Well, and as you're speaking now, I, I also think it also uh, points to diversity and embracing, you know, how e e perfection or, you know, success looks different to different people and that's okay. And I think actually that would be pretty boring um, you know, like she says, if everything were possible, what would be the meaning and point to life? If everyone was the same and, you know, achieve, trying to achieve the same exact things in the same ways, wow, it would be a pretty static and stale uh, backdrop to everything. Yeah. And if you ever need to remind yourself of that, read a book called The Giver. Um, a lot of people read it in, I think, middle school or even the higher grades in elementary school, but it's a book about sameness and, and how it ends up being detrimental to the society. Um, but I think you're right. I think that diversity gives us that vibrance of life and gives us that sort of ability to look beyond ourselves. And, you know, not every butterfly is the same color. Not every creature of wildlife is the same. And, and just knowing that and celebrating those differences, I think, are important. Jumpa and her family spent a couple of days in Salerno in southern Italy. Jumpa saw some nice children's clothes in a shop window and went into the store to see if she could find her daughter some pants. Despite only speaking in Italian, the saleswoman asked where Jumpa was from. Jumpa explained that they had moved to Italy the previous year from New York. The saleswoman said, quote, But your husband must be Italian. He speaks perfectly, without any accent. End quote. Jumpa said that she felt like crying. Quote, Here is the border that I will never manage to cross. The wall that will remain forever between me and Italian, no matter how well I learn it, my physical appearance, end quote. Quote, I understand that my attachment to Italian is worthless, that all my devotion, all the passion signify nothing, as if my Italian were another language. They don't understand me because they don't want to understand me. They don't understand me because they don't want to listen to me, accept me. That's how the wall works. Someone who doesn't understand me can ignore me, doesn't have to take account of me. Such people look at me, but don't see me. They don't appreciate that I am working hard to speak their language. Rather, it irritates them. I have to accept that in Italian, I am partly deaf and blind, and so I'm afraid of being a spurious writer. And so Jumpa, again, who's just a very well, 
a known author and has you know written many books she's still feeling this sort of sense of alienation of not belonging and I was struck by how she had moved between the three worlds in her life, between between you know her time learning Italian and being in Italy, and her time living in the United States and her Bengali parents. Well, and I found her writing to be so honest, and it's almost like she's articulated things that I've thought, but even better than I could have ever even thought them, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Like, she's learning Italian because she has this love for it. You know, she's loved it for a long time. She really considers it in many ways her language. And so she has this devotion and this discipline to study it and she's really made it her own. But then I think we all, you know, once we kind of uh, share that with the world, then it's that's where kind of an unknown is. And she shares this Italian in this very, uh, you know, almost insignificant store encounter with the saleswoman but she's being vulnerable and she's she just completely is devastated when this person doesn't get her she doesn't she doesn't understand where jumpa's coming from and and uh you know i i feel like i've you know in certain times in my life really st adopted some strong opinions or a lifestyle or things that I really actually care and feel like they are a part of me. And then you kind of are vulnerable and you express kind of the importance to other people and, and they totally don't get it. And then you feel crushed because, you know, well, I, you know, feel so important to you. And I, I just felt like she articulated that so well. I haven't really ever heard anyone say it quite like that. Yeah. And you know, her comment about there's always a wall. And I think that that's true so often. We we all come into situations with these preconceived notions of other people, and it ends up creating this wall between us. And, you know, in my experiences, I've definitely felt being on both sides of that wall, you know, that, that sense of not belonging where I'm at, you know, and then being on the other side of the wall of, of having those preconceived notions of that other person and where they're at in their life and their challenges. And I think that if we were more conscious of the, the walls that we're creating, I think we could more easily break them down and at least pay attention to them um, and be attentive to the notion that they're there. Well, and I think the times that I've maybe been, you know, not understanding someone or didn't, you know, didn't, it, it, now I'm actually a little bit more thinking that if I'm not understanding someone, I, maybe I should ask more questions about where they've come from and where they're going to kind of put context around this. You know, had the saleswoman said, asked some more questions of, of Jumpa, she might have had better context. But it's when we have these fast, hasty interactions that aren't really th thoughtful, uh, we can really miss an opportunity to get to know someone and to really connect with them on a level that they feel is very important. Yeah, or I think, you know, I think of the words that the saleswoman used. Instead of saying to Jumpa, oh, you speak wonderful Italian, she said, where are you from? And I think that sometimes the words that we select, even though we don't intend them to feel hurtful or intend them to come out kind of the way that they do or to be received the way that they are, I think it's important to choose our words really carefully. Um, and, and especially when we're interacting with people that we don't know. And like you mentioned, that we just don't know their life history and, and their experiences and where they've come from. I think one other thought that I had is, you know, it's almost giving everyone the benefit of the doubt that they are, you know, if the saleswoman had done that for Jumpa and, oh, she's speaking Italian, sounds really good. You know, she, she might have had a different attitude about it, but she was just... Um, you know, and Jumpa talks a lot about her appearance appearance, and how she's always kind of a, a thought of as a foreigner because she looks, um, you know, not Indian, uh, not Italian, and she doesn't look American. And uh, so I think that giving people the benefit of the doubt and just starting kind of from scratch in interactions can sometimes really open up more doors. I think that that's really true. And on that note, that's where we're going to end for today. Thanks for listening and downloading and for sharing this experience with us. You can also interact with us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where we announce episodes and share additional information about each podcast. If you have questions or comments about today's podcast, please submit them to us via our website at modernathenas.com or our Facebook page, our Twitter account, or our Instagram, which is at Modern Athenas Podcast, or even on YouTube. We would also appreciate if you support our podcast by leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher and subscribing to our podcast.
In our next podcast, we will be discussing a book entitled Expecting Adam by Martha Beck. As we leave you today, we want to remind you to never forget that each of you, like each of the modern Athenas we've been discussing, has the power and capacity to be a changemaker in your own world. Work hard, dream big, and reach for the stars.